You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Everybody and welcome to today's program, Progress Report Implementing Monograph 109. I'm Kate Lina, the Senior Education Specialist with the Federal Judicial Center, and I welcome you to this program. The monograph changes were approved by the Judicial Conference a little over a year ago, and every district has been out there trying to implement those changes. And one thing we know is it has been a process. Each one of you has had your own challenges your own issues to deal with, you've been finding some very creative solutions, and you've had some great stories to share and tell about the results of your implementation efforts. We're here today to talk about some of those challenges and solutions with three people from different districts who've gone through some very interesting um, times with all of this. And we're also going to talk with Barbara Meyerhofer, who's a senior policy analyst from the uh, Office of Probation and Pretrial Services with the Administrative Office. And we're going to have a pretty extensive question and answer period. So we look forward to this broadcast. Stay with us. And let me introduce the people to you who are on the set with me right now. I'd like to introduce Tim Musgrave, who is a senior U.S. probation officer from the Southern District of Texas. And Tim is Northern District, Northern District of Texas. I am so sorry. He is a Northern District of Texas. I knew that. And he is also a mental health specialist. Next to him is Tom Ogden, who is a Deputy Chief U.S. Probation Officer from the All-Encompassing District of Utah. And to my left is Ron Golden, who is a Supervising U.S. Probation Officer from the Western District of Kentucky. Correct? Got them all. Okay. They are here to talk to us about, again, the challenges and solutions that they have come up with. So let me turn right now to Tim to start talking about some of the challenges that he's had and some of the neat things that have happened as a result of all of this. As you know, one of the things that every district has tried to do is change the relationship between the officer and the supervisor, make it more of a collaborative, professional um, effort between those two people working with the, the cases under supervision. And so I'm going to turn to Tim because he has a good story to share about one of the cases that he has in his district. Okay. Tim? Um, I, I had supervised a lady named Cynthia. Uh, my supervisor at the time was Steve Oliver, and we had gone through the case planning uh, where we identified some strengths and weaknesses, set out some goals and objectives. Um, about the next week, Steve and I were out traveling in the field. It happened to be the day Cynthia was going to see a, a psychiatrist at MHMR. Well, we went. It was about a 45-minute interview. Um, my lady was on a certain medication regime, and uh, she was real convinced it was working because it worked well in the institution. She cried the whole time. Uh, she was real distraught, and, and the psychiatrist finally just said, well, what makes you think they're working so well? You've cried for 45 minutes. And, and so they tweaked some meds, and, and she did a little bit better. She really saw us as advocates uh, and as a part of that interview. We'd interjected a few things along the way. Um, about a week and a half later, um, uh, Cynthia's in my office. We're walking down the hall. Uh, and Steve is in a different room at the fax machine, at, or Xerox, and, and he hollers through the, through the doorway as he sees her, hi, Cynthia, and gave her some personal acknowledgement. Uh, by the time we got back to my office, she sat in, in a chair, a little straighter, a little more calm. Mm -hmm. Somebody <clears throat> had acknowledged her, had recognized her. Steve did not know she was coming in, uh, so there wasn't any preparatory work we could have done. Um, but what that did for her, the power in, in identifying her, and so that whole collaborative thing of Steve having reviewed the file, seen her in the field, and it was able to just, you know, spontaneously acknowledge her presence there in the office uh, was really, really strong. Uh, the other thing about working with a supervisor, uh, I've had, I'm into my second supervisor since Steve, and I, but I, I think with, with everybody, it, they have gotten to know me better as an individual, as an officer, uh, and certainly in my case, it's a little bit better. 
Okay, which is great. And I think part of that story for me, the real power of your supervisor and you, again, being viewed as advocates mm -hmm. for her, mm -hmm. um, of the power of two with her. Mm -hmm. um, I had shared with Tim before that I have a niece who was institutional, was in a hospital for a period of time, very short period of time, but she said her greatest fear was that she would become invisible. And for people who are institutionalized for a long period of time in the prison mm -hmm. or in a hospital setting, really can feel that way, that they are invisible. So having mm -hmm. somebody really acknowledge them. And one of the things we do know with supervision is just the power of, of being connected to people or mm -hmm. feeling connected to them and what that does to your self-worth. Yes. And going back to one of the values we hold with the Charter of Excellence of just treating people with dignity and respect and mm -hmm. what a difference that can make just in your relationship there. Um, the other thing you had talked about, if I can just do this for a minute, her medications that she had in the mm -hmm. institution weren't working for her out on the street. In a structured setting where you're told when to get up, when to go to bed, where to go to work, what to do during the day, a certain medication regime may work really well in mm -hmm. that regard. Um, in the community, a whole different set of stressors, of choices, of decisions to make, and that kind of a thing. And so things can really fall apart sometimes out in the community. I mean, life can be much different. Yeah, so really the, the getting connected with somebody before they come out. Oh, it's got to happen. Just because those transition issues are just so huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is going to transition me to Tom Ogden, <laughs> and we'll get back to Tim in a minute. But for Tom, there are a couple of issues for your district. Um, transitioning, Tim frequently doesn't get people from CCCs, gets them from the institution. But the District of Utah has been so involved in working with your halfway houses, which is, of course, one of the strengths you brought to the monograph in the District of Utah um, and the work your district did on the, the monograph. But can you talk a little bit about um, your experiences with the CCC? Yes. Five years ago, we placed an officer, a single officer, inside the CCC. And he had constant contact with both the offenders living there plus the staff. During the time the monograph was being developed, the new one, we were also developing new supervision space. We were fortunate enough to get the building 50 feet away from the halfway house. So now we have all the supervision officers out there who are having daily contact with both the residents and with the staff. They're our contract, we're the customer, they're, they're learning what our needs are through better communication and it's very efficient as far as our travel time to do our contacts. Okay. Um, and it, there's not an expectation that every district out there is going to be able to have their supervision unit right next to the halfway house. But again, that, that connection, the continued connection with the halfway house, I assume has made a difference. In, have you seen results or differences in what happens with people coming right out of the CCC well, and how smooth the transition we, is? We I have hope. with the new pre-release requirements. Mm -hmm. We're seeing them the day they land at the halfway house. And again, it's only a 50-foot walk for them. And we're mm -hmm. having personal contact to discuss their jobs, their family reintegration, all the things that are going to occur when they're back out on the, fully back out on the street on supervision. Um, it also accommodated it to ask officers to make a lot of changes. They had to get used to this contact with the CCC staff. Putting us right next door, we've created an environment that doesn't make that too strenuous on them. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to talk to Tom about pretty quickly is you're the deputy chief in your district. So you have, as I understand it, four supervisors under you who report to you. And what are some of the things that you've done to make sure because we know this is an issue of are all the supervisors doing the same thing, but what have you done in your district to help that along? The best part of implementation is make sure upper management really supports what you want to do and they're talking the talk and walking the walk and that the supervisors are going to be relatively consistent mm -hmm. with uh, how they do the new case staffings or how they treat the new monograph. Uh, actually, I only have three supervisors. True. One of them is home on maternity <laughs> leave right now, so I am acting as supervisor and deputy mm -hmm. chief, and I'm doing case staffings every day. Okay, with, and meeting with your supervisors routinely. And meeting with, okay. we have weekly meetings. We're into this almost two years, because we mm -hmm. had a little bit of a head start with the work our supervisor Dave Christensen did with you, and then my mm -hmm. part in reviewing the monographs early on. 
even into a two years, you have to get out there as the main cheerleader and have weekly meetings. Why mm -hmm. are we doing this? Mm -hmm. What do we have to change to be consistent with the new tenants of the monograph? Okay, thanks, Tom. And I would also say that Sandra Fry from the Northern District of Texas, Tim's deputy, has also been involved in the training over the past year on these monographs and was part of the work group also. Before I go to Ron Golden, who's sitting next to me, I want to show you a piece from our last broadcast in March of 2003. If you just watch that for a minute, and then I'll go to Ron Golden. Thanks. All right, we have another fax, and I'm sorry, I really don't know who this one came from, uh, but this says that the specified number of individual contacts, personal, collateral, etc., appear to be omitted in the draft monograph 109 uh, that was released around March of 19 or 2002. I'm in the wrong century, sorry. Um, our district believes that a minimal number of contacts should be included in the plan based on the assessment and officer's opinion and experience as to what it would require to achieve the desired outcome. Would there be AO audit repercussions for our district maintaining a required number of minimal contacts in our plans? Uh, we discussed this at the break and I think almost everybody has something to say on this. And I understand through the magic of um, technology here that that question actually came from Kentucky Western. So we do appreciate your question. And not only did that question come from the Western District of Kentucky, it came from exactly the gentleman sitting next to me, Ron Golden. And, and we found that out just before we were trying to find people for this broadcast. So I'm going to turn to Ron. That was your question. You were really concerned about these changes. And talk to us a little bit about what happened over the intervening months. Exactly, Kate. That was my question. <laughs> I, I take ownership of it. Um, at, at the time, I, I think that question is insightful mm -hmm. uh, as to where I was coming from then and my feelings about a change. Mm -hmm. uh, I was pretty resistant. We in the Western District of Kentucky had been uh, following the original monograph 109 mm -hmm. for, for a number of years, as you know, and I thought we had supervision nailed. I thought mm -hmm. we were doing it a, as best we could. And I was very concerned, as the question illustrates, about certain offenders perhaps sliding or falling through the cracks, mm -hmm. as well as what AO auditors might think in a change um, that we were implementing. Mm -hmm. And so where have you come from there? What's a changed for you? A long way. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlike Tom's district, though, we've only been involved with the implementation for about eight months. Mm -hmm. However, as uh, Tom was saying, I think that the commitment to change had to be uh, from the top on down. Mm -hmm. uh, we've always been a district that went by the book and because there were certain people, myself included, that didn't really like portions of the mm -hmm. new book, we made a commitment uh, initially with the administrative staff to go by the new book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that commitment uh, carried on by the chief in his um, appointment of staff to uh, be on an implementation committee um, really went a long way for those people buying in to the process. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that we did in our district was to uh, actually think about the change being a gradual one. It, it's not going to happen overnight. As mm -hmm. I said, we've been in it eight months. We're not to the point we need to be yet, mm -hmm. but we're working on it. Mm -hmm. um, we, because of budgetary constraints, didn't train people in our customary way. Usually, when we got a new monograph, the supervisors were given uh, the, the job of mm -hmm. teaching a class to the officers. We reversed that process um, and gave the officers the draft monograph and told them to learn a portion of it and teach it to the other officers. Mm -hmm. and, and that produced such a buy-in mm -hmm. that is still overwhelming to me. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's what our organization did. Along the way, though, personally, in really giving this 100% effort, I noticed that there were some significant changes going on. Um, one of which, um, I guess early on, I was um, involved in a case planning session uh, with an officer, and um, she had um, actually gone a little overboard um, about the supervision activities for mm -hmm. Uh, the supervision issues that she had identified with the case. And I said, what's going on here? You know, 
uh, why are we doing all these things? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I thought that's what you wanted. <laughs> uh, light bulbs went off. That's not what, mm -hmm. now we're changed, you know. And uh -huh. it made me realize they were doing possibly plans to please mm -hmm. me. And, mm -hmm. and now we're doing plans because we're doing what's right by the offender. Right. A big difference. Right. So you work in the supervisor, you work in the case. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Um, quickly, I'm going to go to Tom just for a second because, Tom, um, as much as you've been into this, you too had your own issues with counting stuff. So. I did. I, we all agree and probably still agree that supervision can't be completely done from behind the desk. I had implemented a policy about the number of hours you have to spend out in the field which may be a good idea, there is there's a certain amount, but when you start counting just the hours mm -hmm. and not looking at the subjective nature of the contact and are we, do we have a desired outcome, what in the end happened is a few people short of hours would say, well, let's drive out to that trailer two and a half hours from here <laughs> and by the time we get back, I'll have my five mm -hmm. hours in. Mm -hmm. And they left a the card on the trailer door with mm -hmm. no contact mm -hmm. or no real purpose. I think managers have to give up some of their old control mm -hmm of counting boxes and get more into the nature of the subjective stuff of why are we doing this, what is our desired outcome. Right. Okay. I'm going to stop this segment of the program because I want to get over with Barbara Meyerhofer. And again, as I said, we have a, hopefully a good question and answer segment coming up, so I want to get to that as quickly as possible and give these gentlemen some more time to talk to us. So um, in the meantime, I'm going to move from one end of the studio to the other. And I'd like you to watch a segment that we taped from a National Institute of Corrections broadcast where they're talking about implementing evidence-based practices and pretty much the same thing that we're talking about. And they're talking about it at the state and local level. So there's a lot of similarities going on throughout the criminal justice system, again, at the state level and at the federal level. So please watch this. And it's followed by some quotable quotes that people sent us from around the country and take a second to watch those. We'll be right back. Thank you. Some people emphasize our business is not rocket science. And my response is that it's more complicated than rocket science. Thoughtfully, consistently moving people to exercise personal responsibility and discipline, which takes them out of conflict with the law, is a demanding challenge. There's increasing knowledge from a variety of human sciences that increases the likelihood of bringing about the desired change when we implement our business in a thoughtful, disciplined manner. One difficult challenge is understanding that our improved performance is dependent on our changing what, why, and how we do business in order to more effectively impact the people we supervise. What you've seen today is the initial framework intended to stimulate thoughtful change in our industry. It's long, hard, but doable work. And NIC is in the process for the long haul. And welcome back. I'm sitting with Barbara Meyerhofer from the Administrative Office, Office of Probation and Pretrial Services. And as many of you know or should know, Barbara is truly the architect of Monograph 109 and 111. And she is here to discuss some of the policy issues from the Administrative Office and to answer some of your more specific policy-related questions. So we will get to those shortly. 
but um, Barbara and I have been the two that twosome that's been out on the road all over the country from sea to shining sea, literally talking to the supervisors and deputy chiefs on the changes to the monograph over the last year. So it's truly an honor to have her. We're here with us today. So let me get to some questions for Barbara. First and foremost, changes to the monograph. It's only like 14 months old and already you're making changes. That's, Can you talk about that? Well, certainly. Uh, we do have a commitment to keep the monograph current. Mm -hmm. And so the first set of changes were released in March of this year, mm -hmm. right after they were endorsed by the Judicial Conference. OK. And where can people find those changes? The changes are up on the JNET. The monograph itself is up on the JNET. And we also put together a packet of summary materials talking about what the changes are, why they were made, and also has pages on which the changes were, um, were made. We email those to the probation chiefs and to our supervision points of contact, and that packet, too, is up on the JNET. Okay, and one of the real joys of working with Barbara Meyerhofer is if there's anybody who can write succinctly and clearly, it's Barbara. So those materials will be up there, so look for them. And I know this answer, but I can ask Barbara for all of you if they have questions. Please keep sending them in. That's the way we know what changes are needed in the monograph. If we don't get your feedback, then we really don't know things that we need to clarify. Okay, so appreciate the fact that um, the administrative office really is being is being responsive to the issues out there and to the questions that you have. So, um, so this is coming to a desktop near them, not in a binder to them. That's the case. That is correct. The AO is no longer. Uh, issuing hard copy monographs or updates to monographs. Okay. All right. Um, that's one issue. And let me go on to our second issue, which talks about district reviews, program reviews. And John Hughes just sent out a memo to everyone saying that, again, because of budgetary constraints, the administrative office will not be doing routine district reviews out in the districts. So that whole process is on hold for right now. But Barbara has some information about the updated district review instruments for you. So, All right. We have not, uh, not stopped our efforts to update the district review instruments. As, uh, as Ron indicated, it's very important that the AO reviews be focused on the changes in policies in the revised monograph and that everything we do support districts in their implementation of that. So we, are, we actually have a very significant revision of the post-supervision, uh, post-conviction supervision case file review instrument uh, that is currently out for an informal field test. And we hope to be posting that revised instrument uh, probably mid-June. OK. And in the meantime, what can districts do? Well, we are hoping, actually, that the instrument that we'll be posting will assist them. One of the reasons we're posting it, even though we're not be going out in the near future on routine program reviews is so they'll have an idea of the kinds of things that we'll be looking at and hopefully they can use that in their own self-assessments. Um, actually, I, Tom, I think the District of Utah has been doing a lot of self-assessment and also I believe you folks were scheduled for a program review in August. Isn't that true? Yes, we were, Barbara. Uh, <laughs> we, we were looking forward to that, but everybody understands the current budget problems. Uh, we already ran in our supervision unit what I call a midterm report card that concentrated on the major changes from the 109. I've now received your new draft and I've handed that out to the officers so they can start to look at their own cases and say, where would I stand if somebody else would come in and look at my cases right now? I would like to enter into a collaborative effort in this tight budget and maybe get the District of Nevada or some other close district to come in as a team and be honest with us, use that instrument. We could reciprocate and send a team down and tell them how they're doing and get into those kind of relationships. The important thing is look at the instrument and see what behaviors you need to change to be doing the right thing in the 109. Our district, too, does an internal audit on an annual basis. And I think just having the instrument that the AO is going to use mm -hmm. really goes a long way in our preparation for that and reducing my own personal anxieties about what's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, tangential to that, uh, Mike Laughlin and Robert Fino of our office, uh, as part of their leadership development program, had solicited some ideas from officers all across the district about how can we do supervision better. 
kind of dovetailing in with the new monograph, and I read a, a draft of it, and they, a lot of authors had some great ideas about, you know, things to do to, that fit right in with the new monograph. So. Thanks, gentlemen. And actually, I read a draft copy of that. And I would also say uh, the Northern District of Ohio has done a similar process, sending out um, a, a survey to all of their officers, and thanks to Carmen and Lenora and Susan and the whole crowd up there, and to John Pete for sending that down to us. Um, they did a really terrific review of their district, got some good input from their officers um, so that they can look at what they need to continue to do uh, for the supervision implementation effort. So kudos to all of you and thanks for doing that. So right, and thanks for sharing that with us because, yeah. again, that's the way we know what needs to be changed. Right. Thanks. Okay. On to one of the things that is one of the true hot topics out there, and we know this from the train. We've known this for o well over a year. But PAX ECM 3.0 is coming to a, again, a desktop near you. But it's coming when, Barbara? Uh, the last week in June. Okay, won't we be excited? And all you chiefs will be out at the chiefs conference, so have at it, gang. But anyhow, it's coming to their desktops. What kind of support, training support, can they expect for this? Well, the training plan actually has been a really collaborative effort. Um, we're going to have all of the traditional training elements. We've got the Texas Support Center. They're developing the electronic learning modules. And we're going to have the technical documentation and release notes. Mm -hmm. But we're also working on developing training to, that will specifically help officers and supervisors understand more about what the system can do, how it can work for them, rather than sort of being a slave to it. Okay, which is a, a really big point. One of the things we knew with the original Monograph 109 was that the forms themselves started driving the supervision process and people were more concerned about what box does this thing go into or this piece of information go into rather than figuring out what pieces of information needed to be gathered. So that got to be a real problem, frankly. But the whole notion with the PAC CCM is that it should help again, support the supervision process rather than have automation derive the supervision process. That's and one right. of the biggest things that's going to be in there that everybody's been looking forward to is the case supervision plan, which will be automated. Can you just talk about that just for a minute? Uh, well, the plan itself, it will basically automate the plan that is in the appendix of the monograph, though there will be some significant changes in terms of guidance and on common objectives, common strategies uh, that people can shorthand in to document the strategies and objectives that they themselves have already chosen. Okay, thanks Barbara. And again, this will be coming to your desktop soon, so look for it the end of June. It really, really, really is coming. So, okay, and I know everybody will be happy about that. All right, let me start with our question and answer period at this point because we do have several issues and we have a lot of faxes that have come in and I think I haven't said this yet for this broadcast. We ask the points of contact to send us questions ahead of time. So I do have some of those. Barbara will be able to answer some of them and our three guest panelists will answer some of them. But we would urge you to please continue sending in your faxes to us at any time during this broadcast. Uh, the number should be appearing on your screen as I speak. Um, and if we cannot get to your answer right now, or if you don't think you got a, a full enough answer, somebody will get back to you after the broadcast. But please send those faxes in because that really does help us um, answer your questions and, and know what you need out there. Okay? So let me get to the first question. And this is sort of a composite question that came from several districts, so I've sort of shorthanded what you all said. And I'm going to send this over um, probably to Ron as our resident supervisor over there uh, first. But let me give you the question. This comes from Bill Casalis from the Southern District of Texas, along with Jeff Gill from the Virginia Eastern and Ken Cole from Alabama Southern. So I think we pretty much have almost spanned the entire continent here with this one question. So in case sometimes you think you're all alone out there with issues, you're not. Um, uh, everybody has mostly some of the same issues that you're struggling with. Okay, here's the question basically. What ideas are there to address record keeping by the supervisor pertaining to work that needs to be done in the case? Are districts employing any kind of critique tool 
to be used during the periodic case review process to capture their observations for future evaluations? And how is a supervisor making note of corrections and issues? So it's really record keeping by the supervisor because Form 55A no longer exists. So I'm going to turn this over to Ron first and anybody over there who'd like to add on their comments, please do so. So Ron? Kate, it's interesting that you gave me that very good question right <laughs> off the bat. I hope that's not a payback from last time. Um, but a as I said earlier, our transition has been quite um, planned to be quite slow. And um, one of the things, of course, that we did was to eliminate that Form 55A. You don't see that in our files anymore. Uh, uh, fellow supervisors in the Western District of Kentucky uh, we are a form-driven um, agency sometimes, uh, we'll admit, uh, created another form, a briefer, shorter form uh, for supervisors to take notes during uh, case planning sessions. This works really well for me. I just jot down a few notes and when the planning session is over, I go back to my office and uh, set up my computer and then I use a, a computer-generated uh, uh, performance note uh, to, to make those notes for future evaluations. Um, I think, uh, Tom, you had some other input uh, in your district about how you handle that. Well, what I'd like to add is we've been doing that a little longer. We started the case staffings with the officers face-to-face -face prior to the 109 coming out. We did have advance notice because of some of the work we have done back here. But I think what managers will learn is the more that you sit down with officers, talk about their cases, and understand their strengths and weaknesses and training needs, the easier your evaluations are going to become. Now, following up on what needs to be done in the case, the more you get used to better chrono entries and your listing objectives and strategies in those chrono entries, the subsequent chrono should be supporting that. And I think you can get a feel for, at least for evaluation purposes, much quicker than you think. Tim, as the line officer who is the person who's being evaluated on a regular basis, how are you working that out with your supervisor? I, I'm not sure what kind of notes he's taking. I, when Steve was my supervisor, I didn't see any uh, direct note taking. There were some when we did case reviews. Um, and but otherwise he had he had a lot of little sheets of paper stuck in a file in his drawer. Um, <laughs> uh, Candy did the same thing. I don't know where the pieces of paper came from or what they said, but they were collecting them throughout the year. And and my my pers personnel review came back with very detailed about specific events and happenings. Okay, one of the things that we know and that Barbara and I had talked about all over the country for every circuit that we went to was that whatever the notes the supervisor is keeping on what needs to be done for the case, as you all know, should not appear in the offender's file. And that's one of the most important pieces to all of this. And we know why um, this really is a huge change for people because a 55A used to be in the offender's file and is now not in the offender's file because it is the offender's file, not the officer's personnel file. That's why it shouldn't be there. So, um, Barbara, some of the, the feedback that you'd give people on this that the AO would be looking at actually with the district review? Right. There are actually two things. One, um, I know people are tired of hearing of what version 3 will do for them, <laughs> but one of the things that will be in version 3 uh, is an internal tickler system uh, that can be used to generate entries for an action list. And that should help both supervisors and officers keep track of the individual things that they have to do. And that action list will also incorporate things that you don't automatically enter, things like if it's a sex offender, it will tell you if you have not at least entered into PACS a date where you have verified that sex offender's registration. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that 3.0 will provide some more tools to help keep track of these things. Because it really, and that really will be the activity list that I think really will help all of you, again, as an automated tool. Um, but I'm going to send this back to um, our panelists, again, for a minute, just your response on this, because I think I know what the answer is, but here we go. For, the, for those of you who are supervising officers, and again, as an officer, Tim, this whole new process of the supervisor doing the case staffings with you, actually sitting down talking about your cases, 
going out in the field, what we've heard is that this gives the supervisor a much better understanding, and I just want to reinforce that notion, a much better understanding of what the officer's real performance is and a better sense and trust of what is being done on a regular basis. So if I can send that back to all of you. I think just um, for me personally, going out in the field, uh, sitting down with the officer and, and doing a case planning process is uh, um, beginning to show uh, positive effects. The, uh, the fact that I know the case just a whole lot better um, rather than taking the file home and reviewing it in front of the television while trying to watch a football game uh, is, to me, one of the more positive things about uh, the whole process that we're doing now. I think the case staffings and the general staffings, the more you sit down and act like we're the two professionals here, we're going to put our heads together and do the right thing for this offender's plan, you do learn a lot. I mean, that's much more than looking at a paper file. We supervise people. We don't supervise files. One thing also that we've had happen is, again, I mentioned the commitment by our chief and, and also our deputy chief as well. Uh, they have came out into the field to be in a uh, case planning process, uh, originally just to uh, observe. But that doesn't happen. What we've found is they're in there in the, involved in the collaboration of um, the case plan themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry, Rich, uh, Jerry Ritchie, our assistant deputy chief, drove with me in the field. Uh, it's been a month ago now. But after we finished, it, he provides some, some good feedback on some safety issues and that kind of thing. Um, as a line officer, I've appreciated the feedback, you know, having the other officer there, you know, having my suspo around. And, uh, just getting things from a little different perspective, you know, after we finish a visit or if we're staffing or something. It's a lot more fun out in the field than it is for all those other <laughs> deputy chief duties. <laughs> <laughs> I bet so. uh, we've heard that from more than one person out there, that the reason you got into this business to begin with was not to sit behind a desk and do case reviews and, you know, and do the grammar gremlin kind of stuff. So, okay, let's go on to another question. This one is from Bob Lynch, who is another deputy chief from the Southern District of Texas, and this one I know I have right. Anyhow, thanks, Bob, for your question. Have districts recognized the need to educate CCC staff on tra transitional service issues to ensure a clear understanding of our respective roles in the process? And Tom, we'll go to you on this. I think your, your last couple words there is people understanding each other's roles. When you're working with the CCC, you are the customer. I know it's, I don't want to sound odd that the, the offender's not, but really the courts and the United States Probation Office is the customer. The offender is kind of the, the issue that we're all working around. By the more staffings that I have with them, we have a greater understanding from each other of what their rules are to control the halfway house residents and what our goals are for both their housing and employment, both while they're in the, in the halfway house and after they leave. I just think if managers set up an environment that allows this kind of communication, all the services and the desired outcomes will improve. What we did in our district to um, answer that issue was to, in our in initial training done by the officers, uh, was to invite the uh, Bureau of Prisons CCC staff to that training. And I think that helped to quell any rumors that may have existed about probation's taken over our job or, or things like that. And it, right from, from that training session, the word was out that it's a cooperative venture, you know, with BOP uh, hanging on to, to most of the things while there's still inmates there. Senior USPO Ray Warren is, is our liaison person that, that, you know, handles the people at the CCC, and he does a, a lot of that uh, interim work with the staff there and, and helping, you know, smooth the transition coming out. Uh, as a mental health senior, I, I still get to, to interact a lot with the staff when, when they're, they've got a specific mental health case, getting them into local mental health, you know, facilities or uh, med management issues or something like that. But getting them to the mental health agency right from the CCC and they're, and they're transitioning mm -hmm. onto supervision is really a plus. I mean, to, to get that relationship started exactly. then has been real important, mm -hmm. yes. And it is so much about relationships, isn't it? Um, 
Tim, I'm going to stay with you on this because although we're talking about the CCC staff and working with them on the transition issues, you have a lot of people by virtue of the caseload that you have, and we know a lot of people out there are in the same situation who don't go through a halfway house. So what are some of the things that you do in terms of yeah. helping them transition and prepare for coming straight out to the street? Uh, very often, and very probably more than half the cases that want a relocation to the northern district uh, or that are just releasing out, um, I, if there's any extra conditions we want to do, we'll send a probe 49, one of those waiver forms, and have them agree to a litany of extra conditions. Um, invariably, it'd be a sex offender with, with a couple of conditions, and that's it, and they want to come to our district, and I, you know, not going to happen. Um, so we'll, we'll start, you know, with, with extra conditions. Um, when we do accept the plan, there are times that I'll ask them, what is your community safety plan? How are you going to, to, to do better this time out in the community and not get revoked again or you know, whatever their issue was? Um, if they're a, a substance abuser, what, how are you going to stay sober out in the community? I'll, I'll elicit feedback from them. Um, one of the things I saw Rich James, one of our officers, doing the other day, and he was doing an initial interview. Mom, Dad, the brother, they were all in there. He had his hands all over that case because he had other eyes out there uh, in the community helping that transition to happen. Tim, do you have the opportunity to interface with the uh, person while they're still an inmate at the Bureau of Prisons facility? Uh, usually it's just done in writing. I'll right. ask them to send me something like that. The other day, though, I got a phone call from a case manager at uh, Fort Worth and, and had an offender there, had some questions, and I, it's within my supervision area, so I just drove out and, yeah. you know, spent an hour and a half of my day and just visited with him. He signed the 49. Not a yeah. problem. It was a relocation case. Uh, family lived here. He just got caught somewhere else. Th those cases that show up without the advantage of the halfway house transition, just remember, you have to do a lot of general staffings. Pull in your, your suspects, your other peer people, other people in the community, and you may have to change the plan five times in the first five months. Mm -hmm. yeah. but one, it's one, a collaborative effort. Get everybody involved. Right. One of y'all mentioned that, that y'all have like five contacts. And when you're out in the field, you ought to know five people involved with that case that you can talk to. You know, you got parents, therapists, or whatever, but... I think that was an objective of the original draft okay. that we read, and some officers really uh, uh, questioned whether that would be possible, but uh, I'm finding that in a lot of cases it is possible to have five collateral contacts. It's really not that hard. With rising caseloads, that is imperative. We've got to have the extra eyes out there helping us out. I think from both a correctional and a controlling aspect, that, that helps, you know, with those goals and, and objectives. Okay, back to us. Um, <laughs> we were, we were, so we're having a listening to you. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to a real question here, but uh, just a follow-up question. But I do think it's so important. One of the things that, that Tim was saying was just having, you know, bringing that whole family in and, and something that I think was a conversation we had probably prior to this broadcast uh, with Tim and Tom and Ron and Barbara and me was just talking about looking at what the offender needs are, that was one of the things Ron had alluded to before, is that what the offender needs as opposed to what the supervisor needs, but also looking at the offender's strengths. Who's out there? What do they have going for them that you can really focus on and really capitalize on as an officer? Okay, um, let me go on to another question here from Ken Cole and his gang down in Alabama Southern. And again, thank you for your questions. Um, another question from them was, would you give us some examples of what is expected in the objectives and strategy section? And another person had written an anonymous email, which was fine. Um, should they say something that's more than just compliance with the conditions where I'm going to monitor their activities? And I'm going to send this back over uh, to the gentleman. And Tom, you may want to start with this. Well, I think when you talk about objectives, you have to kind of step back a hair and talk about this, understand what the person's capable of, what the defendant is capable of. Don't make a lot of pie in the sky objectives. Make something that's reasonable and can be attained and build off of small successes. I think people from our educational background and professionalism, what we think is trivial may be a big step in some of our, our cases' lives. And let's make it reasonable. Maybe just getting their first checkbook or getting their teeth fixed. Mm -hmm. And however we can help to refer those things. 
or accommodate those are bigger events for them than in as trivial as they might sound in our mind. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we recognize that and we affirm that whenever they do have those, those kind of accomplishments along mm -hmm. the way. Uh, I think in setting objectives and strategies and things from, from the line officer, uh, for treatment cases in particular, you know, you've got uh, attend and complete, you know, treatment at XYZ agency, you know, um, we'll, we'll do, you know, if it's a conditional release case, we'll be doing pill counts on almost every home visit. You know, I'll ask to see the pill bottle to do a pill count. Mm -hmm. So they need to be very, very specific. I'm glad you mentioned something as specific as a pill count. Uh, to, to walk out and say, I want the person to remain drug free yeah. or crime free, any lay person could have come up with that plan. Mm -hmm. We're the professionals and the technicians. When we talk about the activities that we're going to spend public money to go out and complete, we want them specific to that case. If it's mm -hmm. pill counting, if it's uh, any, anything as specific as making sure that they get the right dental referral. Mm -hmm. We want them very specific to that case. Mm -hmm. This is something, though, I think we have somewhat struggled with. Um, we've, in the past, been very good about identifying supervision issues. Uh, but when you try to translate that to actual offender objectives, it becomes a little bit of a, uh, of a language problem, perhaps. Uh, I can best illustrate by by a recent uh, case that I was, again, mm -hmm. involved in planning with an officer, and uh, we were looking at a young man who had been convicted of a drug conspiracy. Everybody knows those, of course, and one of the supervision issues was, of course, uh, criminal associations. Uh, this mm -hmm. young man was feeling quite isolated coming out of the institution, and we were, in essence, setting him up to say, you can't run with your old buddies stay away from the motorcycle gang, you know, that you used to hook up with. Well, he had nobody else. And what the officer and I did in the planning session was just a, a little more of a client-centered, here's where it might fit into his framework and say, he needs to develop uh, appropriate friendships. You know, he, he bought into that as a helpful tool that we were trying to work with him on rather than stay away from the bad influences. Mm -hmm. You know, conducting the offender objective interviews, I've done some myself, and, and when they're first pulled in, you can see some of the defendants being taken aback, saying, well, why is this guy concerned about my life, really? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it may be coming from a different frame than they're used to. And they will respond. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're so pleasantly surprised that they're not being told, and you must do this, and you must do that, and you must do this. And then we're back to actually showing some concern and asking where their strengths are. Mm -hmm. uh, the war stories they hear in prison or at the halfway houses are, are plentiful. Uh, mm -hmm. They're, you know, if you if you consider the source of where they heard them, somebody that screwed up in the community got sent back, and you know, yeah, they didn't like their PO because they're not going to accept the responsibility. Let's lay it off on you know the guy who sent me here, and so if if, if they will consider that, um, that'll certainly help. But it is a surprise for most of them. Okay, let me go back to Barbara here for a minute and have her talk a little bit more about what PAX is going to do for you in terms of those objectives and strategies and some comments that she has for all of you on this. Well, I think the most important thing is that PAX will include some very common objectives and strategies but it does that for the purpose of preventing you from having to write things down that you are going to be writing down in a lot of cases. It's not a substitute for thought. Uh, and, I, and, and the most important thing, as the gentlemen over uh, have, have talked about, is that they must be individualized to this case. And there are going to be some cases they're not going to have any objectives. And it's not, as I loved what Tom said, mm -hmm. you have to individualize it to what this person needs based on the professional assessment. And so what that comes down to is some of our people are not going to have a whole lot of risks and needs. Mm -hmm. And that's how we start working smart. We are trying to get away from, you know, routine going through the motions in every case so that we can start targeting the supervision resources on the cases that need our intervention to succeed. And do we want to talk just a minute about early termination at this point? Give your plug for that. 
uh, early termination is the culmination. And what the monograph says is that the transition off of supervision is a process. Uh, early termination is a tool that we can use to be sure that there aren't any of these just sort of technical things we're doing because we do have a responsibility to remain informed. Uh, get them off of the caseload and hopefully it will be a reward for their good behavior okay. and their future success. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Barbara. Uh, we have another question from Bill Montgomery from Indiana Northern. Thanks Bill. Uh, regarding the preparation of the initial supervision plans through implementation and subsequent evaluation, unless the case is earmarked for early termination, of course, as Barbara just talked about, um, are you finding supervisors or officers requiring more frequent evaluation beyond timely issue-driven staffings? And I'm going to send this back over um, to Tom or Ron, and then you can all talk about it. If I understood the question, um, other than what we call general staffings of issue-driven staffings, if there's going to be more than one plan within an annual period, mm -hmm. I think what we have to find in our behavior is that if you're going to work on a general staffing, very often you're doing something different when that person's planned. Mm -hmm. So you actually are doing a planned staffing. If you're going to make a major change in treatment, or in any other kind of risk issue, or in maybe placing someone in the halfway house for a period of time, things like that. Even though it's not their scheduled time for a planned staffing, you've just mm -hmm. done a planned staffing. Oh, yeah. So many cases are, could have four, five, six, or seven in a year. Other compliant cases may only have the one. Mm -hmm. so. I also think it's uh, important not to leave the newer officer just out there hanging. And so for me, my preference is to have more of those staffings with the with the younger, newer um, officer rather than your your veteran who probably um, knows a little more about what's going on with the case right from the get go. Um, so th those with the newer officer are are scheduled, you know. And and if a situation arises, of course we can. Although we haven't been doing it like Tom suggests, I think it's a very good idea. Don't become a slave to the six month schedule yeah. if if the if the plan staffing was due in, in June and you have the file out and you're doing a lot of work in May and you're actually changing the plan, well then that's what you've done. Yeah. You've done a plan staffing. Mm -hmm. I think we use uh, seniors quite a bit in our office, you know, doing some, some issue driven staffings, you know, bad UAs or, you know, we need to be looking at the halfway house kind of things, but we'll use our seniors a lot. Uh, of course, before that would ever go before a court, well it goes through our suspos, but uh, we, we're very fortunate to have a number of seniors to uh, to tap into. And, and give yeah. yourselves credit when you're when you're doing these general staffings and, mm -hmm. and meeting, chrono that. Chrono that. Document oh, yeah. that yeah. We, we talked about this case and mm -hmm. we're working on a better plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think that's important, yeah. the plan. Okay, we have two quick, uh, Barbara had something to add to this for PACS. Right, I was just going to say that version 3.0 of PACS, I've gotten a lot of, uh, got a lot of questions on this. It will support the monograph planning deadlines. And included in that, though, is complete flexibility in the ability to schedule the next planned update based on the needs of the case, very similar to the issues that, uh, that they were discussing. OK, and that what, whether or not PACS would track the updates was another facts question that we had here. Um, and the other point to that, and I think Ron was saying that you're not going to leave your new officer hanging, you certainly are going to give um, more guidance and more support to the new officer. And you are also not going to take the worst case that you have that has um, the potential for hitting the front page of the New York Times tomorrow and not give that constant attention from the supervisor and the officer. But this process really allows that um, flexibility, so that's a good thing. Um, another question we had, which um, I think we covered, I'm not sure, Again, from Ken Cole, will version 3.0 calculator, uh, no, that wasn't it, sorry. Well, what will the probation supervision plan include in PACS version 3.0? I think you covered this, but it's, do it again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other than the sections on the objectives and strategies that we talked about that will provide a little more help uh, in the documentation, it will pretty much mimic exactly what that plan looks like in the 
appendix to the monograph obviously with a lot they'll be a lot more features that will be pulling a lot more information but the end result will look like the one in the appendix ok all right we have another one more very quick question from david kinsman from the western district of michigan and we thank you for this david while an offender is at the halfway house can they begin to work on community service hours ordered as a condition of supervision barbara I think it is important that everyone understand that when someone is in the halfway house and we have not yet received them from supervision, the conditions of supervision are not in effect and may not be enforced. However, that doesn't mean that in terms of trying to get people to start paying fines and restitution and community service, that if it, that can be worked out with the halfway house staff as part of this reintegration planning with the offender, with the halfway house staff, um, there it's certainly no reason I can think of right offhand, but the legal eagles, please come slap me in the face if I'm wrong <laughs> on this, uh, why they couldn't begin mm -hmm. to do some of these uh, uh, extra things. Okay. And the CCC staff, of course, would have to agree to all of that anyhow. So I think we have covered the questions. I think we've covered pretty much most of what we wanted to talk about. We have one minute, and I'm going to ask Barbara to quickly talk about what we're going to do with what basically she's going to do. I'm going to hang in there on the phone with her with the points of contact meetings that, again, also had to be suspended due to budgetary constraints. So, What we will be doing, we'll be holding four four-hour sessions that we're calling remote conferences. Uh, as we speak... Cool, cool name. Yes, yeah. right. Well, yeah. real original, right? <laughs> um, but as we speak, actually, we have supervision points of contact signing up for these meetings, and we're going to utilize a technology called Net Meeting that hopefully will allow us to supplement the telephone conversation with visuals. Uh, we can all be looking at the same thing at the same time, which would be very nice. And we're going to hope to cover the content, mm -hmm. uh, at least some of the general content of preparing for PACs from a managerial standpoint, but also trying to set up a real supervision point of contact network so that you folks out there who are doing this work can talk to each other. Okay. Well, thank you. And we thank you for the opportunity to have talked to you today. So on behalf of the Federal Judicial Center, the Administrative Office, represented by my good friend and colleague here, Barbara Meyerhofer, um, to Tim, to Tom, to Ron, I thank all of you for joining us on this broadcast and for your contributions to this program. And I thank all of you for sending your faxes in. Um, keep going on with your implementation process out there and keep in touch. Thanks for joining us today. And we're out.